privilege to share with you this morning from the words of eternal life. And we're stepping away just a little bit from the mini theme that we've been considering God, although obviously we are still considering God this morning. And what we're going to consider this morning is something about, a little bit about wisdom. I'm sure you'd agree that wisdom is something that God has been talking to this congregation about quite considerably in the recent past. And certainly the times that we live in call for much wisdom and discernment. For example, how do we interact, and we've heard a little bit about this, how do we interact, for example, with a government who has been instituted by God, but who is no longer a minister of God. They are not there to punish the evil and reward those that are good. The Bible tells us that there's woe waiting for them because they call good evil and evil good. But how do we interact with them? We've uh, heard very recently about the wisdom and the discernment that's necessary in the way that we interact with this whole COVID-19 and the whole vaccine war and the battle that rages out there. So what is our part? What do we do? What must I do? And what must I say? And what must I share with other people? Very much also currently an issue is what do we sow or what do we share on social media and in conversations with other people? And our astuteness and our good judgment is going to be tested very soon when we have to vote in an election um, at the end of this month, early next month. So, yes, we need much wisdom in these days, but fortunately, if we're in need of wisdom, God's Word encourages us to simply ask for it. James, in the first chapter, in verse 5, says, just ask God if you need wisdom, and He's going to give it to you. James is a wonderful book. You know, James, he introduces himself, and then straight away tells us, count it all joy when you suffer all kinds of things. He jumps around wonderfully between all these disparate ideas. It's like New Testament wisdom literature. In fact, if you want to know how to and what you should share on social media, maybe read the whole of James chapter 3. If you're considering, should I share this or should I nip it in the bud right here? There's a good um, test for you to go through first. Now this word that's translated wisdom that we're going to talk about today in the Bible has various meanings. And it's got different facets and different aspects. The first one is, it means being thoughtful and discerning or modest. And it implies having a cautious character or a cautious attitude. You'll remember also in the Old Testament that when God gave certain men a gift to be able to do something physically, he called it wisdom. He gave them wisdom in all sorts of working with their hands. So it can also be having a practical skill or physical acumen. And then there's also the third obvious choice is just having intellectual knowledge and acumen. And today we're going to consider probably the most important aspect of wisdom because Jesus teaches us directly. And this is watchfully anticipating for his soon return, for his bride, his church. And this is specifically that thoughtful, discerning, cautious attitude that we need to have as we wait and we anticipate Jesus' return. If we're going to be ready for the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we're going to do this by looking at what we read about this kind of aspect in Matthew chapter 25, in the parable of the wise and the foolish virgins, the ten virgins. Now, this parable is the second last in a specific group of 11 parables that are called or become known as the Kingdom of Heaven parables. Now, that's not some clever scholarship or something. The parables start off by saying the Kingdom of Heaven is like, or to what should we like in the Kingdom of Heaven, or the Kingdom of Heaven is as. And in our Bible study recently, we've looked at quite a few of those which are contained in Matthew chapter 13, which talks about the beginnings 
and how the kingdom of heaven is going to grow and how it's going to start small and become large and it's going to be supernatural growth and various aspects of the kingdom of heaven. These last few kingdom of heaven aspects get to the business end of the kingdom of heaven. And it's about the end of this kingdom. The time we're living in right now. This close to the end. They are also, oh sorry, this parable is also the second of two consecutive parables teaching on wisdom. Right at the end of Matthew 24, there's a parable about the wise and the evil servants. And then there's this parable about the wise and the foolish virgins. And to put it in context, this is also the first of two parables teaching about Jesus' return. His, the expectations that the disciples might have had about Jesus' return. So this is so central. It's there talking about the kingdom of heaven, the importance of the end of the kingdom of heaven, about Jesus' return and what to expect about his return and the consummation of the age, and then also about wisdom. So this is a wonderful thing to consider this morning. Just to set the context, because we always want to know what the context of the scripture is, you'll remember in Matthew chapter 24, the disciples asked Jesus a question. And it's one of the strangest pieces of scripture to me. Before they ask him this question, they take Jesus, the Bible tells us, and show him the temple and all the buildings there. And I always wondered, why are they showing him the temple? He was with God when he gave the instructions for building the temple. What do they need to show him for? He knows everything about it and everything there is to ever know about it. So it's very strange. But anyway, after this, it was probably the Holy Spirit prompting them so Jesus could give them the story. He said, not one stone here will remain on another. And then he goes on to give them an answer about the end times. Because they ask, the question they ask is, tell us when these things will happen. When will be this end that you're talking about? And then in verses 4 to 13, he gives a figurative and literal look at a whole lot of aspects about the future. Now, some of it could have been or definitely was fulfilled in the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. And so that the disciples didn't expect Jesus' return to be soon after that, which they would have if they misunderstood what he was saying, he also gives them a warning that it's not going to be soon. So, chapter, uh, Matthew chapter 24, verse 4 to 13, you can read there, you'll see it mirrored almost exactly in Revelation chapter 6, in the first five of the six seals that are opened. You'll see Matthew 24, verse 4 to 13, there in Revelation. The same thing was told to John, and he wrote it down as the six seals that we get in Revelation chapter 6. You can go and have a look at that yourself. So because these events of Jerusalem's destruction could be misconstrued, and then the disciples were expecting Jesus to come back straight away, he also specifically spoke about his return. And that's in verse 29 to 31. And that corresponds to the sixth seal in Revelation chapter 6. A very interesting study. You can go and look at yourself. And then in verse 32 to 42, we're warned that although we wouldn't know the time, we would know the times. We would be able to discern the times of Jesus' return. Although only the Father knows the time, the actual day and hour. And because of that, we're warned to stay awake. Jesus also warns that there will be very different consequences for men according to the conduct of their earthly lives. And this is in verse 43 to 51 of Matthew chapter 24. And because of this, we're warned to be ready. And then following this, chapter 24, we get to Matthew chapter 25. And the two parables of Matthew 25 reinforce the fact that firstly, surely, Jesus is going to return. We'll see that now when we read through the parable in verse 5 and 16. And in the second parable in verse 19, then we'll read also that surely this, the condition of men's hearts when God returns will determine their eternal destination. There will be a different fate awaiting those who remain watchful and who are trustworthy compared to those who are guilty of faithless negligence. So let's have a look at the parable of the wise and foolish virgins. In Matthew chapter 25, we're going to read from verse 1 to 13. Father, we thank you for these words of eternal life that we hold in our hands right now. 
Thank you for the wonderful, they're not gems, they're the absolute fundamentals of life that they teach. When we read this, Father, and these short portions of scripture that we're going to read today, my prayer is simple, Father, that you would burn this onto our hearts, that we can make sure that we're ready, that we're waiting, and that we're awake in these times in which we live. Glory be to your name, and we thank you for your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Reading Matthew 25 from verse 1. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins, who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. You know, these parables of Jesus are so wonderful, but there's unfortunately also, we don't always understand the context in which Jesus tells these parables. The people of his day would understand exactly all the little pictures that he uses in this parable, but for us they seem foreign and, and unusual. So, you need to understand that a wedding in the time of Jesus was completely different to what it is today. A wedding there was basically in two parts. Now you'll remember also that from the story of Jesus that Mary and Joseph were betrothed. So there was first a betrothal, which we would equate basically with an engagement. But it wasn't just an engagement because we were waiting for a wedding venue. This betrothal was a time that the bridegroom would use to prepare a place for him and his bride. And when, you, when I'm talking about these uh, nuances of how or what Jesus weaves into this parable, you'll see also so much more about what he's promised to us. Because he told us he's going to prepare a place. He's going to, in his father's house, and many mansions, mansions. And he's going to prepare a place for us. Because often, this bridegroom-to-be would build some rooms onto his father's house for him and his bride. He may not be able to afford a whole house or, a, or whatever the case may have been. I don't know what the reasons were, but they'd build on some rooms onto the father's house, and that would be their first home. And when all was ready, he would arrive unannounced at the bride's house, like a thief in the night. And he would steal his bride away from her father's house and take her to what was called the marriage celebration, the marriage supper. And he was usually accompanied on this trip with, by, by most of his closest friends. And then the bridegroom party would take this bride away to the celebration called the marriage supper, either via the rabbi who would marry them, or sometimes they were even married at the marriage supper as well. And waiting at the venue would be invited guests, including several girlfriends of this new bride. Parallel, I suppose, to what we would call bridesmaids today. You're talking about bridesmaids, I see the weddings these days are getting more and more biblical because there used to be one bridesmaid, now there's sometimes ten. But this word virgins that is used in this parable comes from a Greek word parthenos. And it simply means unmarried daughters or young maidens because they were friends with this unmarried uh, young bride-to-be. So they were... It was just by implication, they were unmarried daughters. And as soon as this party approached where the venue, where the marriage supper was going to be, then it would be announced, the shout would go out that we heard about in this parable, and then these girls would get themselves ready and go out to meet the groom's party, and they would come, accompany them on the last part of the journey to this marriage supper. And traditionally, they would light the way. They had these little lamps, 
and they would have long poles with a copper saucer and they would put the lamps on the copper saucer and hold these poles out over the wedding party as they approached the venue. Something like this. A little clay lamp with oil. And then they'd have this marriage supper, including the wedding if necessary, and then after that the newlyweds would move into this new home that had been prepared for them. And now you can see in this, what, it makes sense to you what this parable is talking about, and some of the other things that the Bible is full of, these pictures of Jesus, who's our bridegroom, who's going to come and fetch his bride, the church. And he's admonishing us in this uh, parable to be ready. And this means that we need to have wise living in the kingdom of heaven. Now, I should have mentioned long ago, this kingdom of heaven is not talking about the kingdom of heaven in heaven. All of these parables are talking about the establishment of the kingdom of heaven on earth. Jesus came and he started his preaching when he was 30 years old, and he started preaching, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then all his teaching was about this kingdom of heaven that he was coming to establish here on earth. So this is different to the consummation of the age and the kingdom of God on earth and all over the universe. So we need to, in this kingdom of heaven while it's on earth, we need to have, oh, be ready for wise living. And this is the wisdom I want to share with you today. Jesus lets us know that in this parable, that in fact what he expects of us is nothing different to the expected behavior of those virgins, those wise virgins at this marriage supper. That is the behavior that's expected of us, that wise living. So we're going to look at a couple of aspects. And the first one is to live resolutely. Now resolutely is just a word that means with resolve. Live with resolve, staunchly. Have a backbone. Be stubborn and hard-headed where you need to be, in the nicest possible way, resolutely. So how do we live resolutely? I'm sure you'll all agree that any delay, and especially something like this long delay in the second coming of Jesus Christ, often leads to complacency. But any time we have to wait for something, for a long time, we may easily become complacent. We can become relaxed. We forget about watchfulness and this resolve that we need to have. And I'm sure you'll also all agree that this often creeps up on you unawares. Things happen. Life happens around you and this creeps up on you unaware and you can easily lose your resolve. And for this reason, Jesus admonishes us to remain careful and watchful. He says, watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. We need to remain watchful. We need to be careful and watchful that we can show that our patience in enduring is able to stand up for a long time. If we're not, if we cannot show that our patience can last for a long time, that's when we're going to be prone to doze off and later fall fast asleep. Now interestingly, both the wise and the foolish slept. So we need to distinguish between the two. And they both slept because of this long delay. So this is a clear warning to a wise believer. If you're going to experience the same good outcome as the wise virgins in this parable did, then we need to hold the correct frame of mind. And this frame of mind is that even though we might sleep at times, and this is not just literal but also figuratively, we can only sleep if we're already prepared, in case the bridegroom comes while we're sleeping. And what distinguishes is this frame of mind between the wise and the foolish virgins is that the wise are ready for an extended wait and the foolish were not. Now no one knows when Christ will come, it may be later than expected, so we need to be asleep, whether we're, uh, sorry, we need to be ready, whether we're asleep or awake, we need to be ready. As long as it takes, we need to persevere until the end. That's how long it might take, the end. Whether that end be for you, the end of your life or when Jesus comes and calls us home, we need to persevere until the end. Then we're called to live expectantly, expecting something. Now not every sort of preparation is the right preparation and we need to be even wise about our preparation. It doesn't depend on external appearances of readiness, 
If you think about something that you've prepared for, you'll agree that you always prepare according to what you expect. If I were to tell my children, we're going to... Well, I can't tell them now, they're too old, but if they were younger and I say we were going to go camping, or we were going to go and visit something, and we may stay over and camp, they will look and see that if I'm serious, the tent will be packed. But only I'm going to know if I really intended to camp over, because I may have just left the bag conveniently with the tent pegs and the tent poles in the garage and fooled them by packing a tent when I had no intention to camp over. I wanted to come home because I'm a haste mace. And our preparation, according to what we expect, exposes the real true inner condition of our hearts. So, our constant readiness must be because we're expecting Jesus' return. And this is very important. If we're not expecting Jesus' return, then we won't really be ready. It will be an outward show of readiness. Even though we might be prone to doze off at some stage because of his extended delay, we still need to be wise virgins, as we said just now, being prepared already before we go to sleep. Now, the wise virgins who fall asleep because of Christ's delay are not rejected because of this. There's a difference between the wise who may have dozed off momentarily and foolishly sleeping. If you're foolishly sleeping, you've discounted Jesus' return. If you may have dozed off unexpectedly, you're still expecting Jesus' return. I'm just trying to explain the condition of the heart in a way you can understand. Our bridegroom is not physically with us yet, and as a result, we may sometimes fall, we may fail, we may enter into obvious sin. But if we're prepared, we know we can always turn to him and we can repent and he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That is level ground that you can find in 1 John 1 chapter 9. And I always say to each other, pitch your tent on that. He is faithful, he is just to forgive you your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Because you've been wise and you've been prepared. So, if we do fall asleep, whenever we wake up, we are reminded to go, and that there is time to go. Until that shout goes out, the bridegroom is here, we have time to go and resupply what has been lacking, or make right what has fallen into disarray or disuse. There's always time until that shout goes out. And when our Lord returns, it's going to be sudden, it's going to be an unexpected event, and it's going to be too late then to turn to Him. Our level of expectancy will be laid visible. Our, our, our preparedness is final at that point. It can't be adjusted, it can't be changed, it can't be improved. And it's going to determine our eternal destiny. We're also called in this parable to live intentionally. If we consider the wise virgins, they not only took their lamps burning with oil, but they also took sufficient extra oil. They had genuine faith in the divine promises of God, and they had the Holy Spirit at work in their lives. Oil represents our living personal relationship with Jesus through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. It's our faith is this oil through the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. How would you prepare if you were asked to prepare for a long wait? Well, I'm sure these wise versions, one of the things they said was it could be all night. It may be all night. There was no given time that the bridegroom was going to arrive. He arrived when he was ready and he had got everything ready and fetched his, his bride like a thief in the night from, his fa from her father's house. Then he arrived. So if it was going to be at night, all night, have enough oil to burn all night. We may look similar to the rest of the mixture in the church as wise virgins and foolish virgins. All looks the same. But if you go and look... In some of those parables and I spoke about just now in Matthew chapter 13, specifically parables like the weeds among the crops and the fishing net, it tells us that everyone who's in or is interested in this kingdom of heaven looks similar. So it's dangerous to try and weed out. In the weeds and the crops, the, the farmer says, just let them grow together and at the end we can sort it out. And with the fishing net, 
All the fish were brought to shore, and then they were separated, the good from the bad, into different places. God sees our hearts, and he knows our motivation. At the end of the age, God will sort it out. Now, our waiting mustn't be want wasting. Living intentionally means we mustn't waste the time. In fact, we're told that in our dealings with others, and especially those outside the church, we should be redeeming the time. That's in Colossians 4, verse 5. And again, I think in Ephesians 5, maybe verse 16, it says, redeem the time because the days are evil. Well, if we don't recognize that the days in which we are living are evil, then I think we have fallen asleep. This is the time, the days to redeem the time. So, the sleeping of the wise is often a result of this earthly business that we all have to engage in. All of us are involved in some way, even though we might not want to be, in some kind of business on earth. And this is what distracts us and may get us to fall asleep. But we should never allow forgetfulness of the kingdom of God to creep over us. We should never run out of oil. Our lamps may go out, but we should never run out of oil. And wisdom lies in being properly prepared and preparation plans for the unknown. Now, why do the foolish turn to their own company for oil? Why do they go to the other virgins for oil? If they truly knew the supplier, they would turn to him and allow him to help them to remain always prepared. If we step out of the parable for a moment. They should turn to the bridegroom to supply what they need. But we know from the, the end of this parable that they never knew him. That's why they didn't turn to him. So this distraction of the worldly affairs is aptly compared to sleep. It's difficult to look intently for the coming of Christ when we've got so many cares that distract us. But if we are true believers, and we have this oil of divine truth within us, and it's the Holy Spirit is abiding in our hearts and shining out in our conduct, we'll only allow the distractions of the world to compete for our time. We will never allow them to take away our focus. There's no way around the fact that your life that gets in the way is going to compete for your time. That's going to happen. But don't ever let it steal your focus. Your priority must always be on keeping your soul prepared for the return of Jesus Christ. We need to remain instantly ready to transform our minds from every other duty to give ourselves wholly to meeting the presence of our Lord and Master. We also want to live authentically. Those foolish virgins knew that their lamps could only burn for a limited time, but they failed to take this into account. Our lamps represent our outward profession of the gospel, our visible relationship with Jesus, what other people see, our stewardship of God's grace. If this is dead works, if we are busy with church custom or uh, some kind of religious observance, then we're busy with dead works. We, are, we want to be seen to be doing dead works. This is a lamp without any oil. While we attend to the cares and the business of life, which is not connected with Christ's appearing, if we're a nominal Christian, we'll allow our oil to run out and our lamps will die with no way of lighting them again. They will, we will neglect our calling in situations like this. And then unfortunately, upon their return to the celebration, these foolish virgins learned that although there had been a time where it was possible to get more oil, that time had passed. The parable tells us the door was shut. And although they banged on the door and they said, Lord, Lord, open to us, he unfortunately had to tell them those words none of us would ever want to hear. I, truly, I say to you, I never knew you. That time of refreshing had passed. Without oil in our lamps, folks, it's going to be impossible that our behavior will proceed, proceed out of conviction of the truth of the gospel. We will never be able to bear the fruit of a living, growing relationship with Jesus. So, short-term application is insufficient. We need steadfast perseverance. Lamps without oil are good works without faith, and these must be destroyed. If we have lamps which are full of oil, this is faith. Faith in our heart, faith towards God and God's promises. 
And this brings forth good works which will stand up one day to that test at Judgment Day. No one is able to give another the oil. I cannot give you faith. I cannot help you with the Holy Spirit. I'd like to come alongside you and walk that path with you in growth as we try and grow in grace and we try and grow in truth and we want to grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ and we want to share each other's burdens. I want to walk with you but I cannot give you this oil. Philippians 2 verse 12 says us, it tells us that each of us must work out his own salvation. Is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? The answer to that question is found in our relationship with God. Am I seeking Him with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, and with all my strength? Is He my all in all, or will He say to me, I do not know you? Beloved, brothers and sisters, don't be part of the wedding party without taking it seriously. Let's pray. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. My dearest Heavenly Father, the little portions of your scripture that we've read this morning have warned us three times. To stay awake, to be ready, to watch. And Father, we want to be awake to whatever it is that exalts our spirit, and we want to be awake to those things that so easily discourage us. And we want to be ready to fight, Father, against everything that attempts to draw us away from your dear Son and our Saviour, Jesus Christ. We want to be found watching over all that is in us, and that's what's round about us, and those things that press in upon us. And in the struggle, Father, we pray for strength. We need strength against everything that this world pushes out there to preoccupy us through its allures and the lusts and the pride of life and the concerns of everyday life, Father. We want to be steadfast in prayer because we know this is the true mark of watchfulness, the true mark of preparedness. And in this, is, this place where we're in steadfast in prayer, Father, we find that we are worthy only then of the forgiving blood of Jesus as we confess our sins. And Father, we want to live intentionally. We want to grow every day. We want to grow in grace and we want to grow in truth and knowledge. Thank you for this family that you've put us in, Father. Thank you that we can pray with each other. Thank you that we can share these burdens with each other. Teach us, Father, again, how to be watchful, how to be expectantly waiting. We want to live intentionally. We want to have resolve, Father. We want to be expectant of your return. We thank you for these words of truth and life that we read in your word, Father. And our prayer this morning, Father, is simple. That you would, as you've planted the seed in our hearts, Father, won't you challenge each one of us to take a serious look, a long, hard look at if we're living like these wise virgins, Father. That we've prepared properly with the right frame of mind, with the right attitude, with this careful, modest attitude of this wisdom that you're teaching us about today. We ask you also to be with each one as we wrestle with these ideas and these thoughts, Father, and grant us your peace. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your love for each one. In the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen.